So just like um, linear momentum can change, we can also look at the conservation of. Let's look at the conservation of linear momentum first. Sometimes it's uh, easier to draw those parallels. So do you remember like the initial, the sum of all the initial momentum must be equal to the sum of all the final momentum? And it was like M1V1 initial plus M2V2 initial is equal to M1V1 plus M2V2. Remember that? Conservation of uh, linear momentum. And this only occurs only if there are no no external forces. So we have to be kind of careful. There's not um, momentum is conserved or n virtually conserved in many, many cases, but we also have to be careful about what other forces may be acting on the system. Um, like when an object is falling through the sky and it's exploding while it's falling, there's a gravitational force acting on it. And it's not just the force of the collision or the force of the objects pushing away from each other. That's what I mean by external. So um, the internal forces have to be those action reaction pairs. So that's the whole like Newton's third law. That's where conservation momentum um, really lands in terms of Newton's laws. But then we can have the conservation of angular momentum. So just like we can sum up all the initial linear momentum, we can sum up all the initial angular momentum and set it equal to the final angular momentum. So, I mean, that could be like, since my moment of inertia could change, then I could have, I'd have to have like a I1 initial, omega 1 initial, plus like I2 initial, omega 2 initial, is equal to I1 final, omega final, plus I2 omega 2. Because you can change now the moment of inertia very easily. An ice skater brings her arms in, throws her arms back out to slow back down every time. Okay, um, so let's look at a couple of examples. Oh, and this only occurs if there are no, no what? External torques. So very parallel to the linear stuff. All right, so let's look at um, an example. So here's the ground. And here's a place on the ground. Here's a, here's a point piece. Not a momentum, but a point. Um, and here's, a, here's an airplane. Pretend like it's an airplane. So our airplane's moving along with a velocity v. Okay, and it's at this instant, it's this distance right here, r, from point p. Okay, now just imagine for a moment that we don't know it's going to move in a straight line. Um, what would be the moment of inertia of this plane that we're going to assume is like a point mass, M, about point P? M R squared. Okay. And then it's going to move, and later it'll be here. 
and it'll be a distance, we'll call this one R1, maybe. This distance will be R, oops. What will its moment of inertia be now with respect to point P? Yeah. Has it changed? Has the angular momentum changed? So if the angular momentum hasn't changed, but the moment of inertia has changed, so my angular speed changed, but my velocity didn't change. My, my radius changed, so V is equal to R omega, right? Okay, so let's see. If angular momentum is I times omega, and I is m r squared in general. And omega would be what? We've done this so many times. Omega would be what? V over r? So what is the angular momentum of this point mass about this place on the ground? M R V, Mr. V. Oh, very clever, Mr. V prime. Very clever. So this is the angular momentum of a point mass. Now, why is that important at all? Well, what if you have, uh, let's look down on a table. So pretend we've got a table here. And you've got a object that's able to slide on this <coughs> smooth surface so there's no external forces acting on it. And uh, it collides with the end, the very end of this steep. We'll make the steak 4m. Sorry, I'm tired. I'm getting kind of weird. And we'll make it a length L. And to make it even nicer, I'm going to stick a pivot point right there so it doesn't go flying off. All right, so this is before. What's it going to do after? Let's draw some, I'll draw some pictures for you. So, um, oh, 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 we'll say this is a clay bob. So what's the clay going to do to the stick? It's going to stick to it. And what's the stick clay blob going to do as a system? It'll yeah, it'll rotate. So this was the original direction right there. What's going to happen? Oh, my goodness. So now the question is this. This is awkward. Is linear momentum conserved? Linear momentum. Does the clay bob have linear momentum? Blob have, yeah, M times V. It has linear momentum. Okay. And then it's going to collide and stick to the, the arm, this, uh, this rod. And they're going to rotate together, stuck together. What happens to the linear momentum? 
Linear momentum is conserved. There's no external forces acting on the system. What's acting on it? All right, so since the pivot applies an external force, there's no uh, linear momentum is not conserved. Now, what about angular momentum? Is there anything, there's no friction. Is there anything applying a force at a distance r from any of the objects? Our sticky puck is on a frictional surface. There's the force between the sticky puck and the rod, but that's an internal force. That's the, for the action reaction force between the two when they collide. Anything slowing it down? We're on an air hockey table. No. So what's cool is that angular momentum is actually conserved. So is angmom sons? Yes. No external. Whatever. Torque. There you go. Okay, so how are we going to solve for what is the um, angular speed of the system after the collision? How are we going to figure that out? So if we look at the clay sticky puck, sticky puck, coming in for a landing at the moment right before the collision with the end of the rod. So when it's infinitely close but not touching, what's the distance from the pivot? L. <laughs> Very good. So our initial angular momentum of the sticky puck would be m l for the length, v for the velocity that I gave you. What's the final angular momentum of the system? Are they stuck together? No. So what would you do? So two masses added together, but uh, the would it be different if I put the pivot in the center? So what do I have to be careful about? The moment of inertia. That's right. So I'll have to use the moment of inertia of the, the puck plus the moment of inertia of the rod times the angular speed that we're looking for. Let's see. That means we'll have M, capital L for the length, times V, the speed of the sticky puck as it goes in for a landing. Oh, what was the moment of inertia of a point mass? M R squared, and R is L in this case. Plus, oh, let's see. What was the moment of inertia of a rod about its end? Yeah, one third, and I told you the rod was going to be 4m, so it's heavier. R, L squared, sorry. Mm. I don't have words. And then omega. So what's the angular speed then? What can I do mathematically here? Get out your lightsaber and... Can I divide by m on both sides? Can I divide by an L on both sides? Multiply by every term? So V divided by what? What gives us three? V over 
seven, what, elk? Don't forget that guy. And you should notice that that's in the correct form. Isn't um, angular speed like V over R? Where it's a velocity divided by a, a length? Is this a velocity divided by a length? And then it has the coefficient basically in front of it. So we can actually find the angular speed of the system after the collision. Isn't that crazy? So we can start throwing things at our ice skater. If she catches them, it'll speed her up. Does that sound like fun? <laughs> All right, let's go back and um, look at the airplane one more time. So here is our, our point P, and um, we had our, our airplane. And th this was like our R1, and this is like our R2. Okay, um, so when it's directly over head, the angular momentum would be m r v, which came from um, it being m r squared v over r, right? Now we just said that the the angular momentum is not going to change to this guy. So, what is the initial angular momentum and how can I get it to equal this? My initial angular momentum would be m r1, that was a v, and then times v. What's the relationship between R1 and R2? Do you see one? Yeah, it depends on the angle. So what's the relationship then between R1 and R2? Um, okay, so it would be the cosine of that theta. What if instead we use the angle between the velocity and the radial arm, kind of like we do for uh, torque? Don't we use the, the angle between the force and the radial arm? So then what would our relationship be? So then let's see. Um, Opposite, so the sine of theta would be R2 over R1. So R2 would be R1 sine theta. That might sound like I'm crazy. And then our final would be M R1 sine theta times V. Now, question. If we look at the angle... that the velocity is making with the arm, the sine component is actually like perpendicular to R, kind of like torque, right? Then the sine component, wouldn't that be V perpendicular? Okay. And if I was looking at it over here at the beginning, that's when the angle is something. So. So it would be like, um, what if I used 
this expression for both of them that the angular momentum is m r v sine theta. I'm going to put a sine theta at the end just because I don't want to screw anything up. Would m r v sine theta be possible to be equal to no less than theta m r t t so what was the angle between the velocity and r2 what's the sine of 90 So we can write the angular momentum as being mRV sine theta. Oh wait, what's m times v? Oh my goodness, let me remember. So p right times r sine theta. Sine theta, that makes me think of a cross product. Remember, torque was force cross with R. So, our velocity crossed with R. So, it winds up being M V cross R. This is probably the one we use most often. 